I have a quick little question for you this morning. How many of you would consider yourself a follower of Jesus? Raise your hand, follower of Jesus. Believe it or not, for some time now, there have been some folks who make a distinction between a Christian and a follower or a Christ follower or a follower of Jesus. And the argument being that far too many people classify themselves as Christians, but their lives and their behavior and their practices do not line up with Scripture. And I suppose I understand the argument, but to be a true Christian is to be a follower of Christ. And as you read through the Gospels, you'll notice many times where Jesus simply says, follow me. And to follow Christ is to follow his teaching and to mold your life after his teachings. In essence, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Become more like him every single day. And there's a section of Jesus, a section of scripture rather, that reveals much about Jesus and it encourages us to imitate him. We've picked this up in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and following. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but on a lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became confident to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Really an incredible passage of Scripture. We could work through all of it for some time if we really wanted to and learn something about being a follower of Jesus. You know, be like-minded. Be of one accord. Be in agreement. Don't be selfish or conceited. Don't think too highly of yourself. But Put others before you. Look out for the needs of others. I mean, all of that is encapsulated here in it. But I want to pay attention to a couple of verses. The Living Bible puts it this way. 2, 5, and 8. Your attitude should be the same, should be the kind that was shown by Jesus Christ, who, though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God, but laid aside his mighty power and glory, taking the disguise of a slave and becoming like men. And he humbled himself even further, going so far as to actually die a criminal's death on the cross, on the cross. Jesus exhibited true humility at all times. And this scripture confirms that he is, in fact, God, equal to the Father, yet he laid aside his power, his glory, his might, and took on the form of a man. The language here is he emptied himself but he did not empty himself of deity, and that's an important distinction. He is and was God. He entered himself as a position, if you will, of God and became a man. I said it's an important distinction. The Greek here is kenoso, and they call this uh, the theory of kenosis, and it, it means to empty, to void, to make empty. Now, some argue what's been called the kenotic theory or kenoticism, which is an unbiblical view of what is happening here with Christ, nature. Canonicism teaches that Jesus gave up his divinity <clears throat> when he became man. He was no longer God. He became man. And they're thinking that's what that scripture says. But verse 6 disputes that. It says, by nature, Jesus was God. And I think Colossians helps us really define it more than any. Colossians 2.9, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. And the Living Testament says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So Christ came, yes, as a man. He humbled himself, but he was fully God. He emptied himself, if you will, of his divine privileges that he had in heaven. He left heaven. Rather than staying on the throne, he made himself nothing. He became humble. He became a servant chose the position of a slave, came as a servant with absolute humility. It is no greater form of worship than what Jesus did in doing this in worshiping the Father. 
His worship of the Father was absolute and in complete submission to the Father's will. And Philippians 2.5 says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let your thinking, let your whole persona be like Christ. Behave and act like He did. He modeled what our attitude should be in serving God and in serving others. Christ was true to the Father and He was true to Himself. There was, is, and was nothing false about Jesus Christ and nothing hypocritical about Him. He was who He was. And Jesus had no place for hypocrites, particularly spiritual hypocrites. And we all know what I mean by a hypocrite. I mean, a great big act lacking any sincerity. It's like this little boy named Johnny. He reached for the phone one Saturday as it rang, and his dad said quietly, if that is the guy from the office, tell him I'm not home. That evening, the family went out to dinner, and before leaving the restaurant, Johnny's mother said, you know, they undercharged us for this meal. And he said, well, that's their tough luck. And then on the way home, he bragged about his little dashboard thing he had on his dashboard that kept him from getting tickets called the fuzz buster at the time, and so it already paid for itself and the speeding tickets he would have got. And that night when Johnny went to bed, he finished his, first finished his Sunday school lesson, he thought, you know, what, what a good Saturday had been. How much better than last weekend when his father grounded him for cheating on his test at school. I mean, that's a hypocrite, right? Behaving one way, I mean, ouch. And, and those that are closest to a hypocrite know the truth. Husband and wife are discussing the possibility of taking a trip to the Holy Land. And the husband said, wouldn't it be fantastic to go to the Holy Land and shout the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai? His wife looked at him and said, we'd be better if we stayed home and kept them, as only a wife could do. <laughs> but you know what's sad about it? We know what a hypocrite is, but the world associates, much of the world associates a hypocrite with people of faith, or at least religious people. And the definition of a hypocrite is a person who pretends to have virtues, moral or religious beliefs, principles, that he or she does not actually possess, especially a person whose actions belay stated, belies stated beliefs. Another dictionary states, a false appearance of pieties or virtues in sincerity. Someone may look good on the outside, but their inside, their heart is entirely different. We know First Samuel tells us that Man looks on the outside appearance, but God looks at what? The heart of man. Looks at where you're at. And God is never fooled by religion, hypocrisy. He desires a serious relationship with us in every way. He doesn't pull any punches when it comes to how he feels about an insincere relationship. He, Christ didn't hesitate to call, call the false religious of the day a hypocrite. But for God, his demand of Sincerity is reciprocal, or reciprocal. It's, he's sincere without hypocrisy in his relationship towards us. And God is continually calling us to a pure relationship. And when we answer, we are the ones that benefit. We're the ones that get blessed. And God deserves nothing less than being truly sincere when our relationship and where we're at, where we've been, where is our walk, and where are we headed. Joshua 24, 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. A large part of serving God involves worship. Jesus worshiped the Father by emptying himself of his divine privileges in heaven and came, if you can imagine, everything we understand about God Christ in heaven, in his glory, said, I'm going to come down here and be like a man. And I'm going to come here, not all puffed up like this major king, but a servant. And serving God in sincerity is indeed worship in action. Not just the times we come and worship with our voice, but to worship God with the things we do. And the New Testament agrees with this. Paul writes to the church of Corinth this. He puts this in 2 Corinthians 1-2. Now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relationships with you with integrity, with godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom but on God's grace. 
You know, we've often said that worship comes in more than one way. Certainly our worship and song, as we just did a few moments ago, is an important aspect of it. I talked about it over the years. That's extremely important. But our actions, our sincerity or insincerity is indeed a, it, it, you know, a form of sincere worship or can be. We find kind of a lengthy discourse this morning with Jesus at Timotheus well, went at the well, but it puts a perspective on how God views worship, and let's look at it this morning. Pick this up here in John 4, verse 5 and following. Now he, Jesus, came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away in the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to them, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her and said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from himself, as well as sons and all of his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will be and come in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said I have no husband, but you have had five husbands, and the one with you now is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, I, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor Jerusalem worship the Father. You will worship what you worship, what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. A lot's going on here, but the first thing I want to notice is that when Jesus acknowledged this woman, knew knowledge of this woman and her life, it startled her. I mean, you, you know, you've had five husbands, and the guy you're with now is not, you know, not even your husband. And, and, you know, her conclusion was, this guy's a prophet. And so she quickly changed the subject. Uh, she didn't want to hear any more about her lifestyle, and she probably also wanted answers. And so in 419, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where we're not to worship. Now, she's talking about Mount Gerizim, what they called the Mount of Blessing. It's across a narrow valley, and across the valley was Mount Ebal, the Mount of Cursing. And a guy by the name of Ballot, the governor of Samaria, he opposed Israel. And he received permission from Alexander the Great to build a temple on Mount Gerizim, just like the one in Jerusalem. He built it for his son-in-law, Manasseh, and made him a high priest. This guy said, I'm just going to create my own thing over here. And the Samaritans established rival worship to Jerusalem and accepted the Pentateuch as their Bible. I mean, you begin, you see this, this problem with Samaritan and Jews all throughout the Gospels, and you begin to see part of the reason why. And their controversy between the Jews and the Samaritan was, do you worship on Mount Gerizim or do you worship on Moriah? And that's what she's asking him. You guys say you worship here. We want to worship here. You know, you're the prophet. You tell me. 
She seized upon this opportunity of meeting this prophet in her mind. Get the question answered. And Jesus' answer is important. 21 of verse 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you'll neither, worship, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. I want you to notice here that Jesus did not pick a spot because worship is not a place. Yes, we come to worship. We came this morning to our worship service. Churches put out signs announcing worship service and the time that it starts. That's all it takes to worship, put up a sign. I mean, what does it really mean? It's like this little kid one day, he went to Sunday school morning and he going to bed that night, he knelt down to pray and he said, Dear God, we had a really good time at church today. I wish you'd have been there. <laughs> Just going to some place does not make worship. And true worship is of the heart. Look at verse 23. The hour is coming, and right now, now it is, when true worshipers worship the Father, wow, in spirit and truth, the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Do you want to get God's attention? He's looking for worshipers. And apparently, Jesus distinguishes between true worshipers and false worshipers. You can spend all kinds of time worshiping falsely, and it means absolutely nothing. Not one of us desires our worship to be false. Isaiah spoke it here. We've talked about this just recently, but 29, 13, the Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. The worship is made up only of rules taught by men. This is how you worship. Do this, you'll be good. Man. So the Samaritan woman was questioning their worship against the worship of the Jews. But let's see what Jesus had to say about the Jews. He told her, you don't know what you're worshiping. Watch this. Matthew 15, verse 1 and following, Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they did not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, First he said, God says, Now he said, You say, Whoever says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have, receive from me as a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. It's interesting how Jesus turned this. And for the Jews, you know, the religious, the washing of their hands was no small thing. A deliberate violation of not washing your hands before eating could mean excommunication. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I guess he never hung around tradespeople, right, Tony? I mean, it's like, you know, it's lunchtime. Let's go. I mean, come on. We're mechanics. But anyway, look at the discourse. Why do your tra disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? He turned it back around on them. And the leaders of the day had established that the traditions of men had been elevated over the status of Scripture. They just didn't. They accused Christ and his disciples, and he in turn accuses them of breaking the commandments of God. They preferred human invention and religion more than God's word, what man thought it should be. Jesus made a distinction between their actions and the intent of their heart. Once again, the sincerity of how they're worshiping. And he turns to what seemed to be 
a common deceptive practice of the day. Why? Because it spoke of their heart. They're supposed to be religious. They're worshipers. It's their heart. If you didn't want to support your parents, I mean, the Bible says honor your mother and father. And tradition back there in the Jews was extremely important. And if you didn't want to spend the money in their time of need, they used it as a tradition to evade the law. They would enter into the deal with the corrupt priest for a small percentage for the priest, and they dedicated things to God that should go to their parents. So it meant that their money was frozen and could not be used for taking care of their parents, freeing them from the lawful, lawful obligation, yet still giving them access to the money. Christ called them hypocrites. You see this practice you're doing all the day, all the time. You're, you're just being liars. You're being hypocrites. You worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Your heart's revealed by your actions. And basically, in vain do you worship me. I didn't want my worship to be in vain, and I don't think you do either. I want it to mean something. I want my worship to mean something to God. I want my worship to mean something to me. And I think we need to understand, as we've tried to, how important praise and worship is to us in our relationship, in our development, in our growth in God. Was our sincere intent on coming to church this morning to worship God? Why did you come, and what's the point of coming to church? Is it to truly spend time in worship? And if so, when is your next time of worship? Next Sunday or next hour? Tomorrow. You know, we don't have to. Obviously, it's extremely important to come, but we can worship God any time of the day or night. And it really should be part of our lifestyle. Are our lives one of praise and worship? Or are they only moments of praise and worship? Because Christ is looking at your heart. Scripture wants us to know if our hearts are close to God or are they far from Him. Like I said, our lives can be one of praise and worship. We should have a good understanding of the difference. We've said this for many times, and we talked about it, I think, even last week. We praise God for what he's done, and we worship him for who he is. And, you know, that's a little simplified things, but it does help us begin to understand the difference between praise and worship. We praise God. We thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. We just worship him just because he's God. And praise is a true form of worship, if you will. Praise means a lifting up. Last week, we looked at seven different words in praise in Scripture. The Hebrew and Greek words for praise can mean a giving of glory, of honor, a thanks offering, a commendation, applause, a hymn of praise. And praise has been described as commendation bestowed for personal virtues or worthy actions. It differs from fame or celebrity. The expression of gratitude for personal favors bestowed to extol, to lift up, to boast. Praise, price, and prize all come from the same root word. To applaud excellent works, to give God praise. To look at his wondrous, wondrous works. Our lives should be like that. Everywhere we go, we should, we should think, if you will, about what God's done in our life and the beauty and the things he gives us and the provision he's given us in our lives. A continual acknowledgement of our God. Worship becomes a deeper form of praise. Worship goes beyond praise, transcends praise. And worship is a shortened form of worth-ship. And worship defined means to state worth. Excellence of character, reverence, honor, adoration, thanksgiving, homage to pay divine honors. To honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. Bended knees and bowed heart. Those are the definitions. To honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. In the original Hebrew and Greek language, we find worship means to bow down, to fall down, to kiss, to fawn, to adore, to give reverence, to give glory and honor, to minister to God, service to God. In all those words you see, this complete submission to God and worshiping for who he is. To honor with extravagant love and extreme submission is to worship God. I don't know if I've ever reached that place of this extravagant love and extreme submission. Because somehow self seems to get in the way quite a bit, doesn't it? 
but to know that we can go there. There's a place in worship I don't think we've even been yet. And yet we begin to touch on it when we understand what it is. How would our lives be different if we daily were daily continual worshipers of God? doesn't mean that you don't go about your busy lives, but in it you find a way to bring worship. A person that God would describe as a true worshiper. A true worshiper of God and not hypocritical. And the origin of hypocrite, you know, the word we see, it means an actor or a stage player. That's the origin behind it. And we've said many, many times that, you know, we've looked at this in the past, that worship is far more than singing songs on a Sunday morning. That said, we never want to make the mistake of understanding the importance of gathering Sundays in corporate worship. It's so important. But if you're unwilling to consistently worship in a weekly corporate setting, it's doubtful your life will be one of true worship. It's doubtful you'll spend much personal time in worship throughout the week. Many years ago, there was a very popular song, Here I Am to Worship, written by a guy named Tim Hughes. At the time, he was director of worship at Holy Trinity Brompton at Anglin Church in central London. It became a very popular song. He was interviewed one time, and he said this, I was studying history at Sheffield University, and I've been reading through the book of Philippians, and I came across that passage that talks about an imitating Christ's humility. How he came and gave up everything he had in heaven, walked on earth, was a beating to death even on a cross. We looked at that earlier. He said, I've been gone living in that scripture for a while, and often for me in my personal worship. I just kind of started out pouring, pouring, I started out pouring out things in my heart, and these words began to form. Light of the world. You stepped down into darkness. It felt like such a strong verse, and I knew there was something in the song. He goes on, I spent weeks and months trying to finish the song, but I couldn't. I kind of forgot about it. Then about six months later, I remembered it, and I was listening to a batch of old song ideas I had. I <clears throat> found this melody. It felt like it fitted really well with the verse I had, and suddenly the song came together. I had the verses which we were speaking about, all about that Jesus had done, and the chorus, it was to be a real heartfelt response to this amazing love and sacrifice. So it came together, and it's just been hugely encouraging, exciting. See how the song is connected with people, because I wrote it in my bedroom at university, and I had no idea how it could affect so many people. It's a little song he just kind of created for himself, if you will, and wrote it. And when one day he was asked about the role of a worship leader, and he said this, I love what John the Baptist said of Jesus. And when he hears a bridegroom voice, his job is to decrease so that he, Jesus, can increase. That's part of true worship, isn't it? Worship begins with an attitude of humility. Just as Christ had in, in Philippians, let this mind be in you. Christ came as a servant. Didn't set himself higher than anybody else. Didn't deny who he was. He was God. He served. He healed. Performed miracles. Always did it in humility. It's never been about style or genre of music. I know certain things move us more than others. That's clear. But where's our heart? Where's our heart? A fellow named Tim Hughes who wrote the song, he injected this. This is interesting to me. He said, I just read this amazing article in a newspaper in America. It's attacking modern trends of worship and music, and it's saying that the lyrics aren't centered on Christ as they should be. That they're ungodly, and the music is about making money, and it's just really slating modern music. So I wondered who this was written for and what about. Actually, it was written in 1723, attacking Isaac Watts, who wrote to him, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. You know, it's always been an argument. He writes, so I think it's helpful for us to remind ourselves that in the day those hymns were written, they were radical, offensive, and shocking. We always need to be open to a fresh move of songs and music. To be honest, if we want to see our churches continue to grow and attract young people, which is a desperate passion of mine, he writes, and we must keep moving with the times while 
keeping the best of the old. It's always been an argument. Way back then, I remember years ago, maybe 30 years ago, there was a book out called The Worship Wars. It was during a time of transition when we were, the church was moving away from the hymns into the modern worship we sing now, and, and people were in an uproar. And these hymns were like sacred to people. And what they don't realize is that many of the hymns were written in the original, what they called the bar ditties of the day, and those tunes and those ditties, they just put to worship, and people were just like, how can you do this? What is worship? Invite the worship team forward. So Tim wrote, Light of the world, you step down in the darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. We're going to close with that song. And as we close, let's mean the words we sing to God our Savior. Here I am to worship. To worship in spirit and truth. Let's stand together this morning and worship our God.